This episode will explore the subsystem required to evacuate the cyclotron's chamber so as to clear the way for the ion beam's path. UMD's MSE PhD student Noah Hoppus will take us through the science and technology of the cyclotron's vacuum system. If you were as light and small as an atom, the first thing you would notice is that gas molecules are battering you all over the place. But then, if you took a moment and collected yourself, you might notice that walking in any direction, you could only travel a micron or so in air before you ran into another gas molecule. That distance is known as the mean free path. In our atmosphere, the mean free path is on the order of microns. This presents quite a problem for accelerator designers because ions traveling down a beam pipe would quickly be battered around and come to a complete stop if they had to travel through any gas at all. Imagine an accelerator beam pipe. If the mean free path of the gas inside the beam pipe is much shorter than the beam pipe, then the ion beam traveling down the beam pipe would quickly lose energy because it's getting battered about by running into gas molecules, and this simply won't do. Accelerator designers, in order to preserve their beams, must increase the mean free path in the beam pipe in order to ensure that the beam reaches the target. To build a successful particle accelerator, you have to get all of the gas out of the way of your beam first. This process of getting gas out of the way actually turns out to be quite troublesome. In order to resolve this problem, engineers have invented many different methods of pumping gas and achieving vacuums. The term vacuum is actually a bit ambiguous, so we refer to five different vacuum pressure regimes. The first, the low vacuum or rough vacuum regime is where the cyclotron roughing system operates, and it extends from atmospheric pressure down to 100 pascals. Between 100 pascals and a tenth of a pascal is the medium or fine regime. Below that, from a tenth of a pascal to 10 to the minus 6 pascals is the high vacuum regime, where the cyclotron chamber normally operates. Extending from 10 to the negative 6 to 10 to the negative 9 pascals is the ultra-high vacuum regime, and anything below that is considered extreme high vacuum. These regimes are not exactly hard and fast, and you'll often hear people referring to pressures that sort of border on one or the other fairly loosely as ultra-high vacuum or extreme high vacuum or high vacuum. In the rough vacuum regime, the mean free path is actually still short enough that the gas acts viscously, like a fluid, like water or honey or anything like that, where the motion of gas molecules over here laminarly affects the gas molecules over here. They exert a shear force on each other. This actually makes pumping quite easy, and you can build a pump very similar to a water pump or an air compressor, known as a rotary vane pump, that operates quite effectively in the rough vacuum regime. Inside, an offset flywheel expands gas on one side and compresses gas on the other side. On the expansion side, gas is drawn in viscously from the chamber, and on the far side, the gas is compressed and expelled into the atmosphere. A puddle of oil inside of the case of the rotary vane pump seals everything up and prevents gas from backflowing into the chamber. This is what we use to achieve roughing pressure in the cyclotron system. One small drawback you can imagine to rotary vane pumps is that when the motor stops and the vane stops spinning, gas can flow back through the rotary vane pump and suck all of the oil into the vacuum chamber. To prevent this, a one-way anti-suckback valve is normally used in the roughing line. To measure the pressure in the rough vacuum regime, there are two commonly used options. The first is a barometric gauge, where the force on a known area is measured. The second of these is a thermocouple gauge. A thermocouple gauge exploits the fact that the thermal conductivity of a gas is proportional to the mean free path. Inside the thermocouple gauge, a filament is connected to a thermocouple element which measures its temperature. A constant current is passed through the filament in the thermocouple gauge, depositing a constant amount of thermal power. If the gas surrounding the thermocouple filament is very thermally conductive, i.e. high pressure, the filament remains quite cool as measured by the thermocouple element. If the pressure is very low, then the filament is well insulated and reaches a very high temperature as measured by the thermocouple element. In the high vacuum regime, the mean free path is now long enough that the gas molecules spend much more time interacting with the walls of the chamber than each other. In this regime, we refer to the flow as molecular. In order to pump gas in molecular flow, 
more complicated systems are necessary. One common option is the diffusion pump. A diffusion pump uses supersonic jets of oil to capture individual gas molecules and pump them down and out of the chamber. In order to achieve this, a diffusion pump uses fundamentally three parts. The first is the heater. The heater resides at the bottom of the pump chamber and boils the diffusion pump oil, forcing it upwards. As it travels up, it then interacts with what is known as the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is so-called because it looks quite a bit like a Christmas tree. In fact, a Christmas tree is composed of a series of conical baffles which redirect this upward traveling oil jet back down so that any gas traveling into the throat of the diffusion pump is deflected downwards and out. Finally, there is a water-cooled jacket around the outside of the diffusion pump which condenses these supersonic boiling oil jets so that they can then travel back down to the boiler to be recycled. Most of the pumping in a diffusion pump happens in the short time between exiting these conical baffles known as chevrons and touching the cooled wall of the diffusion pump. Unfortunately, at high temperatures, atmospheric oxygen damages diffusion pump oil. In order to prevent this, diffusion pumps are normally backed by a rotary vane pump to reduce the partial pressure inside the diffusion pump to acceptable levels so that the oil lasts for a significant period of time. The second problem with the diffusion pump oil is that it can backstream out of the top of the diffusion pump into the vacuum chamber, contaminating sensitive surfaces and components. To prevent this, a cryogenic baffle is normally placed above the top of the diffusion pump so that there exists no line of sight from the center of the diffusion pump into the vacuum chamber. To measure pressures at high vacuum, one simple and commonly used option is the Bayard-Elpert ionization gauge. The Bayard-Elpert ionization gauge is actually a triode vacuum tube. The first element in a Bayard-Elpert gauge is a hot filament that produces electrons. Opposite the filament is a collector wire, which is biased to a negative high voltage, normally around 500 volts. In between the filament and the collector is a coiled wire grid biased to the positive voltage. The electrons from the filament bombard gas in between the filament and the grid where they come to rest. If there is very little gas, very few ions are produced. But if there is a lot of gas, many more ions are produced. These ions travel through the grid towards the negative potential of the inner collector wire, where they come to rest. The current into the collector wire is then measured with a sensitive ammeter to determine the rate of current flow. A small current flow means very few ions were produced, meaning there was a very low pressure in the gauge. A very high current flow means that many ions were produced, meaning that there was a very high pressure in the gauge. Bayard alpert gauges operate comfortably from a tenth of a pascal all the way down to 10 to the negative eight pascal. Here we have a collection of high and low vacuum flanges. This is a conflat flange. A conflat flange uses triangular knife edges to bite into a copper gasket. Copper gaskets come in a sealed bag to protect them from environmental contamination. In order to assemble a conflat flange, carefully remove the copper gasket from the sealed bag, place it between two flanges, and then use 12-point silver-plated hardware to connect the two flanges together. The silver plating is important to reduce friction and prevent galling of the fasteners. Stainless bolts in stainless threaded holes will gall and seize and you will not be able to achieve the required torque to crush the copper gasket. So we use silver plated 12 point hardware. Additionally, we use nut plates on the backside so you don't need two wrenches to tighten. Tighten in a star pattern, going from one fastener to the opposite fastener all the way around the conflat flange so that the gasket is evenly crushed. Here we have two different sizes of Wilson seal. You can see that Wilson seals seal on cylindrical surfaces by tightening an external nut which squishes an internal o-ring onto the radial external surface of a cylinder. They're often used for sealing to glass tubes and other fragile cylindrical items like a Bayard-Alpert gauge. Wilson seals come in many different sizes, one for each different diameter of cylinder you could want to seal to. Here we see a quick flange abbreviated KF, also known as an NW flange by other manufacturers. KF flanges are sealed by a Viton O-ring with a centering ring inside which prevents the O-ring itself from sliding around 
or being sucked into the center of the vacuum system by the external pressure of the atmosphere. The Viton O-ring snaps onto the centering ring itself, making the whole assembly rigid. It's placed into the counterbore on the KF flanges. The external surface of the KF flange is tapered so that a simple radial clamp axially squishes the O-ring. Here we see two different sizes of KF flange. One's constructed from aluminum, the other constructed from stainless steel. The clamp on the left is known as a machined clamp and can be used to compress harder O-ring materials. The KF on the right uses cast clamp, which is generally weaker, uh, suitable for common Viton and Buna N O-rings. For KF sizes larger than 50, external taper is emitted and an external groove is added to be gripped by C clamps. In addition to the internal centering ring, an external centering ring may also be added to the O-ring to prevent the O-ring from being extruded if there is overpressure in the system. A swage lock fitting consists of an external nut, a washer, a conical ferrule, and a conical seat in the main body. The conical ferrule is compressed by the outer nut into the conical seat, squishing it in radially so that it bites down onto a pipe. This biting action is known as swaging. Swage lock fittings are used for leak-free gas handling in high vacuum systems. The cyclotron includes many of these vacuum flanges. Here we see the roughing pump connected with a vacuum bellows to the diffusion pump, flanged in KF25. The diffusion pump is connected through the chamber valve to the cyclotron chamber. The chamber valve and many of the cyclotron chamber ports are all flanged in con flat two and three quarters. Here the Bayard Alpert ionization gauge is connected to the top of the diffusion pump with a Wilson seal. Here we see the filament heating up so that it can produce the electrons required to measure the residual gas in the volume of the gauge. The yellow tubes which transport the compressed air which actuates the chamber valve are connected to the chamber valve with swage lock fittings. Here we see the diffusion pump pumping on the cyclotron chamber. We have now removed the diffusion pump and have disassembled it. Here we see the main body of the diffusion pump. Inside is the Christmas tree assembly. The Christmas tree is hollow and has many external conical structures known as chevrons. When oil is vaporized in the base of the diffusion pump by the heat of the diffusion pump mantle, it travels upwards and is smoothly redirected back down into supersonic jets by the chevrons. The outside of the diffusion pump is jacketed with cooling tubes to recondense the oil vapor as it makes contact with the external surface of the pump. Above the top of the diffusion pump is the water-cooled baffle. The water-cooled baffle blocks any line of sight from the oil vapor to the vacuum chamber so that no backstreaming oil vapor makes its way into the chamber. Above the water-cooled baffle is a cryogenic trap. The cryogenic trap is cooled by liquid nitrogen, which freezes out any oil or water vapor traveling from the cyclotron chamber to the diffusion pump, in effect scrubbing it so that it need not contaminate the diffusion pump oil. We are now going to view the maintenance and repair of a diffusion pump where the oil has eventually corroded after exposure to atmospheric oxygen. Here you can see the cyclotron chamber vacuum system being disconnected from the diffusion pump, the Bayard Alpert gauge being removed for safety, and the roughing line being disconnected from the pump. And here, the whole diffusion pump stack is removed from the cyclotron system. Here you can see the cold trap being unbolted from the top of the diffusion pump. Now the diffusion pump is being removed from the frame which suspends it so that the top of the diffusion pump with the water-cooled baffle can be removed and out comes the Christmas tree. At the base of the Christmas tree you can see that black carbonized diffusion pump oil. 
To the right, you can see a brand new, clean Christmas tree. Here, solvents like acetone and lint-free Kim wipes are being used to slowly remove the caked on diffusion pump oil. The old diffusion pump oil is then drained from the main body of the diffusion pump. The O-rings are then removed from all parts so that they can be replaced with fresh O-rings. Similarly, the inside of the cold trap is cleaned of any condensed diffusion pump oil. The water-cooled baffle is also likewise cleaned of any spare diffusion pump oil. A Scotch-Brite pad is then used to clean any surface to which carbonized diffusion pump oil could be clinging. One final wipe over with Kim wipes and acetone prevent any particulates left from the scouring process from interrupting any of the new O-ring seals. And with that, all of the pieces of the diffusion pump are shiny and clean, ready to be reassembled with brand new diffusion pump oil. The diffusion pump oil of choice is Dow Corning 704. Before reassembly, all of the O-rings must be cleaned and coated with a fine, thin layer of Apision high vacuum grease. Reassembling the diffusion pump, bolting on the water-cooled baffle, reconnecting the water cooling lines, and attaching the cold trap. The whole system is then carefully reinstalled on the 12-inch cyclotron. The roughing line is reconnected. The connection to the 12-inch chamber is made. The water cooling lines are attached to the cyclotron. And the glass Baird Alpert gauge is finally carefully reinstalled having been protected the entire time to prevent any damage. Now we begin a cyclotron pump down sequence. First, we start by turning on the water chiller to cool the diffusion pump. Next, we turn on external water cooling from the building. Next, we turn on the cyclotron's electrical systems, open the roughing valves, turn on the roughing pump, and start diffusion pump heating. The initial rough pressure of the vacuum system, as achieved by the rotary vane pump measured by the Pirani gauge, is just below 100 millitor. The roughing valve is then closed and the main chamber valve opened, connecting the diffusion pump to the cyclotron chamber and disconnecting the direct line to the roughing pump. Liquid nitrogen is then added to the cryogenic trap above the diffusion pump. The pressure at this point will begin to drop and go below the range of the Pirani gauge, so we switch from the Pirani gauge to the ionization gauge readout. As the diffusion pump heats up, it begins to efficiently pump and the pressure drops from the millitor range down to the microtor range. Once the pressure is in the microtor range, there is sufficiently little air in the chamber such that the cyclotron beam may be turned on. Because the cyclotron beam is so long and coiled up inside the chamber, a very large mean-free path is necessary to ensure consistent beam transport. To date, 
The best 12-inch cyclotron runs have been achieved when the pressure in the chamber has been at its minimum. At this point, we have an understanding of the cyclotron magnet and the evacuated cyclotron chamber. In the next episode, we will look at the ion source, which is where the beam is born.